The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Let's talk about the movie that proves beauty's only skin deep. As long as you're willing to pay lots and lots of money for corrective surgery for any physical faults that you might have. The hottie and the naughty. What the fuck? Boom. Hey everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Jay Wilford Neville. <laughs> and we are here to talk about, I, I guess, the Paris Hilton vehicle? Is that, vehicle. I, I mean, is that a good way to describe Yeah, I don't know if vehicle maybe is more like kind of a suppository. I guess that's a vehicle of sorts. It's kind of made to showcase her, even though she doesn't play that big of a role in the movie, really. So I don't, I'm, I'm not really sure if it counts as a vehicle, but it was sold with Paris Hilton, right? For sure. That was basically the selling point, right? Was Paris Hilton I, and some other people. Yeah, I think so. Holy shit. That's, you're, you're going to hear some background noise in my recording this week because it's 93 here in Portland. So, uh, um, Fahrenheit. I, I he have, means Fahrenheit. Uh, Those that's right. 93 degrees Fahrenheit. A sensible method of measuring temperature <laughs> may be slightly freaked out when he says 93 degrees. Anyway, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's focus on the plot synopsis here. Ford, you want to, you want to sum up the plot to this movie in 20 minutes or less? So basically, the plot of this movie is that Joel David Moore, whom you may recognize from Bones or from Avatar, realizes that the reason he's never found love in his life is because he's always been pining for the girl he had a crush on in first grade, Paris Hilton. And so he goes back to his old stamping grounds in L.A. in order to try to reconnect with her, stalks her a little bit, manages to find her, discovers that in order to date her, he has to first get past her hideously ugly best friend and that's basically the whole purpose of her is be ugly and to be a barrier so eventually the best friend starts getting some plastic surgery finds a guy who's interested in her and hijinks ensue or something yeah all right before we jump into that let's go through our what the fuck moments uh forge you want to start us off got your classic movie device of the expositional douchebag also fits the trope of the disgusting best friend, yes, right? Yes, definitely. June Fig, the hideously ugly best friend, so they claim, gets horse noises whenever she's mentioned or on screen. And dog noises. The line, oh, that's just my stalker. Our main male character, Nate, is unemployed, yet he spends over $3,500 on this woman at the, the by the 30-minute mark of the movie, which I don't have that money to throw around right. on women. Neither do I. <laughs> Maybe he sold a kidney off screen. Perhaps. We never saw him with his shirt off, so it's possible that there was a scar that we didn't notice. We also never saw any women with their shirt off. I know. It was a very tame, because it is at its heart. I mean, it's trying to be a sex kind romp. of a sex romp. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a romantic comedy, but it's it's focused so much on the physicality that I think it goes farther into the realm of sexy romantic comedy, right? Or it definitely does, and you kind of have to wonder if the reason that it steered so clear of actually really depicting anything sexual was because Paris Hilton was just trying to distance herself from the roots of how she got famous. Sure, though of course we we could have had lots of side female characters get naked. I mean, it, you know, it's like Good Luck Chuck, uh, what's her name never actually got topless in the movie. Right, but there were tens of thousands of naked breasts in the movie. <laughs> billions and billions i think every like the every woman in night. the world was cast as a topless extra in that movie and then there came back around yeah. and played a second character with like a wig or a fake mustache or something <laughs> yeah. it's like rob schneider they just put him in a hawaiian face and called it good <laughs> Did you notice the thing that really shocked me about this movie is that it's written by a woman? Uh, I suspect <laughs> that there were some significant rewrites. Although, I don't know, I guess the movie doesn't necessarily hate women all that much, right? It's, it's, no, well, it's no more misogynistic than every other romantic comedy or sex romp. I'm not sure. I think this movie has a lot of hatred, for sure. 
I just didn't know what to feel about this movie because it really felt like it wanted to be saying something about beauty is only skin deep, right? But then it just undercuts itself at every turn. It it seems to think that it has the opposite message to the one that it does. And I can't imagine what the rewrite could have been that caused this. I mean, I, I guess perhaps including the plastic surgeon at all could have been the rewrite that was introduced right because if if you take him out because here's here's the big kind of like subversive thing that's in this movie that if it hadn't been so dumb would have been pretty revolutionary and awesome but the big thing is that uh, uh, Nate our main character winds up falling not for Paris Hilton but for the naughty June right but not until she starts getting pretty not until she is indistinguishable from any other hot actress. And and it's possible that the timeline there is what <laughs> was is what might have been changed of like when that kind of stuff happens. But I guess it's it's not necessarily exclusive to men to hate women or to have those kinds of ideas that a woman's beauty is the only thing that's important about her. What I kept thinking through this movie was, well, especially towards the end, I guess I didn't really think this till the end, but at the end of the movie, I thought, if this movie had been told from June's point of view, I think I would like the movie. Mm, I'm trying to picture what that would be like. Well, A, we wouldn't get to see everything that makes the main character detestable. Oh, that's true. He would just be kind of this goofy, possibly likable character. I mean, that's the that was the main problem that I had at the end of the movie is that June basically gets this horrible choice because in, you know, romance movies, you can only have a choice between two, maybe three people out of everyone who exists in the universe. And her choice is between this essentially a one night stand with a really pretty but really shallow guy or falling for Nate who has no real good qualities but at least Johan the really pretty but really shallow guy like at least he's honest about what he wants right he's going to give her all this free dental work and plastic surgery and in exchange she will be grateful enough that she'll sleep with him, and then... My thing with that is, it wasn't presented like, you know, Ben Affleck and Mallrats. It wasn't like, I'm using her to hurt her in some way, or I'm using her to, like, get some horrible, kinky fetish thing out of it. It was just like, she's gonna be grateful, and I'm gonna get sex out of it. And it was like, A, didn't really seem like he needed to go that route. So that was a little <laughs> odd, because he was, you know, perfect at everything. But B, even if that was it... So? (laughs) Right. Well, as she said, like, I want to not be a virgin anymore. Like, she even wanted that herself. They they were using each other. They're both being honest about it, and that's totally fucking fine. Yeah, and, and, and then she gets all upset, and it's like, oh, but I have feelings for this douchey guy. And it's like, but why? Why? You know, I mean, yeah. all he's done through the movie is stalk your roommate and uh, try to get you out of the way so that he can spend more time with her, you know? Yeah. He's not reliable or interesting or dependable or... Charming uh, charming. or intelligent or even very good looking himself or... (laughs) Yeah. Why is anyone interested in this character? Uh, Like, we know that he's a horrible liar. He premeditatedly lies to everyone and he's not even a good liar like he doesn't even tell convincing or interesting lies yeah and he and his friend torture a dude right that was a little weird yeah suddenly in the middle of the movie we have fucking uh clockwork orange, clockwork orange sort of bullshit going on and it's like you know that scene happened and i was like i don't know am i supposed to want this character to be immolated in fire by the end of this movie it seems the only interpretation is that we actually want we're supposed to want everyone but june and arno's mother to die yeah and then june winds up with our main character so it seems as if it's kind of a uh, a horrible depressing ending yeah that's a fate worse than death Exactly. I I I really felt kind of torn at the end of this movie because I was like, oh, June finally like found somebody and she's been the most interesting character all along, yet I hate this person. 
that one of the things that I wrote is like June is the only person in this movie I don't hate. And I guess what's his name, Johan or whatever. I mean, he just like I I wouldn't necessarily want to hang out with him, but I don't think I hate him. Right. You know, he's just kind of this good-looking guy who's perfect at everything, you know? Yeah. He's one of those guys that you want to hate him, but he's probably too nice to actually hate. I knew one of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's he's probably got some secret, you know, like maybe he skins children or something, but but that never comes up in the course of the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not canon. <laughs> And something I really wondered about the end of the movie is that, okay, so June has now gotten, like, microderm abrasion and dental work, and her face is very, very pretty, but I wondered, like, does she still have the back knee and, like, the kind of uh, weird hair and everything, and, like, is he gonna get home with her take her shirt off and then suddenly there are horse noises and he's like oh god what did i do because he is so fucking shallow that's a good question i think we got a pitch for hottie and the naughty too right here is what we have is it the naughty and the naughty (laughs) speaking of which how can you have a movie called the hottie and the naughty and the naughty is not spelled n-a-u-g-h-t-y oh that's number two the hottie, H A U G H T Y. Right. The hottie. Yeah. And the naughty. The sequel is, is the hottie and the naughty. Right, right. And it's about uh, some chick who's stuck up and some chick who's a kinky bitch. You know, I mean, that's. that's and it turns out that that's they're the, the, way the same go. girl in a wig. Right. Yeah. Why aren't so, we writing movies? <laughs> We really should be. (laughs) So the ending felt like it was trying to be very progressive, right? It felt like it was trying to make this statement. The other place in the movie where it felt like it was trying to make a statement and it just came across as what the fuck is going on here was Paris Hilton's character pretends to be really fucked up and drunk at this party where she and Nate are supposedly going to have sex for the first time. And she pretends to be drunk and pretends to fart a lot in front of him. Right. And then afterwards, she's like, oh, well, you didn't judge me, so you're not here just for my looks. What were they trying to say there? Yeah, I, <laughs> w- what the fuck was the point of that? Because it was like, well, if he had been, like, kind of, like, uh, I mean, isn't that, I wouldn't that be, like, understandable? Like, wouldn't it be, like, I don't really, like, I'm not really turned on by you, like, drunkenly accusing me of things and farting all over the place? Like, does that really say that he's not shallow? I guess. Maybe that was what they were trying to do there, was they were trying to redeem his character by showing that he will overlook a small amount of flatulence if he thinks a chick is hot enough. <laughs> But it's like, that exactly, that's what it comes across as, is like, I'm not going to be bothered by this because you're hot. It doesn't feel as if, like, I'm not shallow, you know? Because there was not really any point in the movie where June was an unpleasant person, and yet, because she wasn't hot, he was totally repulsed by her. That whole scene, I think it was meant to be this, like... Oh, you know, look at how progressive Paris Hilton is, like, testing him out and shit, and he just seems, like, oblivious to what's going on the entire time. It's like, he's just like, uh, what the hell is going on? Oh, well, anyway, you anyway, know? Um, let's do it. It's like it doesn't affect him because he's just blithely waiting for the sex. That, that, that doesn't really prove that he isn't shallow. This movie has to be the most shallow thing I have ever watched, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's the most shallow movie I've ever seen, for sure. <laughs> and there's not just... I've seen porn that was far less shallow. <laughs> Had better writing. There's not just, like, the pretty privilege, you know, the, the ugly people hatred. There's also, like, old people hatred. There's... H- hatred? There's, there's also ageism. <laughs> For instance, when Arno's mom mentions that she had a bikini wax done, it's like, someone over 40 with a bikini wax. Gross. (laughs) That's probably what they wrote in the script as directions to the person who was writing the score. It's like, this is what we want the music to say. (laughs) They also took a big old shit on albinos. That was fucking weird. Like, I didn't know what to feel about that because... I don't even know what, like, albino stereotypes are. (laughs) Uh, That albinos are creepy and evil. That's the stereotype around albinos. And so, of Uh, course, the stalker guy. Is is albino a 
Is that an insensitive term? I don't know. Do they prefer really white people? I don't know. <laughs> I, it's. <laughs> I still say little person sounds more derogatory than midget, so I'm not the person to ask here. I am not the fucking go-to authority on on this at all. But yeah, it really, I would think that it would only be like a bad stereotype if he were like committing assassinations, because that's how albinos always show up in movies, is as like secret assassins. Hmm. Yeah, so you mentioned the whole exposition douchebag. Right. Arno, his best friend, has a file on... Christabel. Christabel, yeah, yeah. How fucking creepy is that? And it's not just a file, it's a whole, like, documents box. Everything about that character... I mean, A, they didn't cast a very charming actor, I didn't think, and it has nothing to do with his size, it just had to do with, like... I he just felt like he should have been an extra in like a uh, a beer fest movie or something like he should not be playing best friend you know yeah he didn't have the charisma and he didn't have the presence to be taking on such a fairly major role and just everything about that part was so upsetting I mean it, it, it's he's this character who lives at home and. Uh, bullies his mother into taking care of him. Like, he's literally playing Super Mario and yelling at her at at one point, and it just felt like... I, I mean, I guess it's that we're supposed to find it funny because it's so pathetic, but it really just felt like I wanted to reach through the TV screen and stab him in the eyes. That character was pretty terrible, and there was a moment shortly after we first met him when he was describing june and he's like doing all of this pantomime and acting as though she's a dragon and he's breathing fire and like they actually put that moment in the trailer but Mm -hmm. it was not even a tiny bit funny even even if you're the kind of person who finds ugly people funny and finds describing how ugly a person is funny it just totally fell flat I well, I would say that's true about damn near everything in this movie, right? Yeah, and the the funny thing is that the pacing of it is sort of done as though they expected to put a laugh track in <laughs> after the characters say something or something happens that we're obviously supposed to think is funny, and the music goes. Rrr, rrr. Everyone pauses for a moment to wait for the laughter to subside <laughs> before the movie begins again, because obviously we're going to be cracking up. Maybe they thought they were filming a pilot for a sitcom or something. Well, I did a little bit of research, and Heidi Ferrer, who wrote this movie, also wrote a couple episodes of Dawson's Creek. Wait, was that a laugh track sitcom? I can't remember. No, it was not. (laughs) I prefer to remember it that way. And the character who played June uh, was in Step by Step. Mm, There's a conspiracy here, and I will root it out! Speaking of the acting, I, I was kind of shocked. I, I didn't think Paris Hilton did a bad job. I mean, she had to play kind of a vapid, distant, pretty girl, and I thought she did perfectly fine at that. I don't think uh, she had to play that. <laughs> That's just what she can do. I think yeah, that but it, we were supposed to like her. I think that we were supposed to think she was not just hot. We weren't supposed to think that she was a reprehensible person. We were supposed to actually like her, I believe. Yeah, I, I kind of came out of this movie being okay with both of the girls. It's just, it's like, and, and Johan or whatever the hell his name was, I was okay with him. It's just our main character and his best friend and the guy that they torture, all of them were, <laughs> like, on my shit list. Yeah, well, and not just them. Like, practically every man in the movie, like... They've gone to rent a a sailboat for the day, and the guy who's supposed to pilot it comes out, takes one look at June, and turns around and literally runs back up the dock, saying, you'll have to get yourself another skipper! She's so disgusting that he has to run away. It it was disheartening, to say the least. It it was not just him, either. It was virtually every male character, until Johan comes comes along and starts helping june to become pretty again again yeah johan i I don't know (laughs) johan really does seem to be kind of the uh the unsung hero of this movie i mean he's awesome at everything and he helps bring her out of her shell and i guess nate kind of does too but that really doesn't make any sense as to why 
June in this movie reminded me a lot of like I really thought she could have been played by Janine Garofalo really well though I guess uh, probably by the time this is made Janine Garofalo is maybe a little too young and then I was like but that wouldn't have worked because Janine Garofalo is so just naturally hot and everything but obviously this girl is too and they had to just put her in makeup and then I started thinking, <laughs> they made that movie. Do you remember that? I think it's The Truth About Cats and Dogs, where <laughs> oh, yeah. Gene Garofalo plays the naughty and Uma Thurman is the hottie. Oh, yeah, they totally made that movie. That's probably why you made that connection. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I remember the ads for that movie where, like, they portray it as, like, she's the ugly stepfriend, and I'm like, boy, do they not understand my sexuality. <laughs> Uh, this movie did have another one of our favorite tropes from your romantic comedies, the random uh, which musical one was number. That? You ready this time? Was there? I don't even remember there being a musical number. <laughs> no, in this one. you. Johan picks up the guitar and plays it in the coffee shop, and suddenly oh, that's the coffee right. shop that's is right. chock full of people. None of them are singing, but they're all like yeah. swaying and dancing to the music that not particularly impressive yeah that's right he does kind of like kick out a cold play tune <laughs> everybody's like you're the most talented person ever yeah but again i think it's his raw charisma that he can just control a crowd must be that we should we should sing a song about how beauty's only skin deep <laughs> This this movie also had another one of those incredibly depressing lines. Most of us are just happy to date a guy who brushes his teeth. Right. <laughs> Is that true? Um, ladies? Ladies? <laughs> Is that true? Ladies? <laughs> like, are you willing to put up with torture as long as they brush their teeth? <laughs> it did have a whole bunch of slow motion Paris Hilton <laughs> montages. There was, like, <laughs> when we first see her, she's running along the beach along her path that is littered with stalkers, and she's right. running in slow motion there, and that scene lasts, what, two minutes? Yeah, it takes a while, yeah, yeah. And then uh, when they go to sunbathe after the horrid captain abandons them and won't pilot the sh sailboat, she takes off her robe and to display her bikini, and then there's random slow motion montage just of her from different angles for no apparent reason <laughs> i would love to like find out if the heidi who wrote this is like just full of hatred against super pretty women and that's what the but she but but paris hilton's character did end up being fairly oh, what's this? sympathetic you know right um she wasn't terrible. I, I know that, like, the slow-mo Paris Hilton running, I'm like, I'm thinking I'm supposed to feel, like, turned on here, but mostly I was just like, God, she's got really good form. She obviously <laughs> works out a lot. You know what I was, was thinking like, I wish was, I could run. Like, was even when moving in slow motion and her hair blowing in the wind and her breasts jiggling in slow motion and stuff, she seemed so wooden to me. Well, I guess not wooden. She seemed so robotic to me that... I had flashbacks to a video I recently saw of robots that had been designed for advanced DARPA testing of bipedal robots, and they were all failed <laughs> tests, so the robots were all just like, <laughs> falling over and stuff while trying to open doors. That was the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> She just, to me, always seems like she's got so much Xanax in her system. She's just like, oh, well, what do you want to do today? I'm really stoked. Let's grab a bite to eat. Oh, I think I ate already. Okay, hey. Yeah, I, th I think she may have been lobotomized. That's certainly possible. I don't know. This is one that I kind of recommend watching because I think... Um, uh, you'll question if there could ever be a god uh, after you watch it, and that's always a good sort of experiment with the abyss to have. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at it now, in hindsight, Wilford, uh, if you could change one thing about this movie, what would it be? What I would have happen is basically like I was the, sort of this sort of I sort of hit on this earlier. Change the timeline. Like in order to make the main character not reprehensible, what would need to happen is for june to disappear to have her hair fixed and her teeth fixed and cosmetic surgery and stuff and i guess her hair lasered off and everything and for him to realize while she is away having last seen her in her pupil state to then <laughs> realize that he loves her and then have her come back beautiful if she's gonna have to become beautiful 
right? All right. So that okay. so that okay. so that he yeah. can have he can have some decency in him and have realized that he really does care for her, and then his reward to be that she now conforms to his standard of beauty, and possibly better yet to like in the last five seconds before it goes to credits throw in a little hint that somebody may have hypnotized him using electrodes <laughs> on his head the same way that he did to Cole Slawman. Okay. And, and while you were talking about that, that made me think of a point that I was going to bring up earlier because I was thinking of my answer and my answer is that most likely I, I would have made it from June's point of view or else I would have made it so that June doesn't get prettified and we have the same sort of basic plot progression. The thing I was thinking is if she doesn't get prettified, we have to take Johan or whatever the hell his name is out of the picture. And what if she were matched up with the best friend, you know, in the same way that the best friend was supposed to have sex with the horribly obese, ugly woman in Good Luck Chuck. He does the same thing here and hooks his best friend up with her, right? And and while I was thinking of that, it reminded me of, did you find it odd that the best friend who is creepy stalker guy number 75 in this movie doesn't seem to have any libido whatsoever? He's just Jack's obsessive compulsion. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he has, like, there are never any jokes about him, say, watching porn or anything. It's it's not even clear why he keeps a file on this one. Right, he's clearly been creeper-stalking Christabel himself, and so why would he turn that information over to his friend he hasn't seen since the first grade? And speaking of which, like, I believe that all of the characters in this movie, like, when we smash cut from first grade to adulthood... I think that the characters did the same thing. I think that they did not form <laughs> any new memories or have any other experiences in the intervening period. That is very possible. It does seem to kind of be somebody off screen handed them a script or whatever and it was like, go. It's the only it's the only frame of reference that the characters have. The they only reference things that happened in the first grade or during the movie. <laughs> But so I don't I don't get his best friend like at all, because it's like, you know, wouldn't the way to have written him be like him talking about like jacking off and wanting to like fuck Christabel all the time? But no, instead, he's just perfectly happy to play Mario Brothers while he has a fucking file on this woman. I mean, it would be it would be pretty damn progressive and impressive and i would recommend this movie to people if they like wrote an ace into it i would be impressed if there were an asexual character in a movie i mean i guess he is right but it doesn't see it it but he's still it, it's kind of like how oh well they put an albino in that's progressive but the albino is a creepy stalker so maybe not you know and it's like okay so he's asexual but he's a creepy stalker asexual not all men are creepy stalkers. I'd say 20, 25% tops. Uh, aren't. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I th so I think for me, I, I would have I would have either done, I, I would have done the movie from June's point of view, and like at the end of the movie, she would have just run the hell away, or maybe she gets Paris Hill. Ooh. And yeah. that's how the movie ends. Yeah, that would be good, actually. Because, like, they're roommates. They've been best friends since first grade, at least. And June has obviously, in most instances, driven men away from Paris, right? Because that guy comes up to hit on her in the bar mm -hmm. and she just totally eviscerates and emasculates him. And so, like, she's obviously been running that interference. It would be an interesting twist for the reason that they've been that way is because they've never really been able to admit to themselves or one another or the world that they were in love. There you go. I mean, it, it, all the pieces seem to fit. All right. We need to write movies. We should start our own movie studio. <laughs> we should. I I actually have a, I have some friends in the biz. Maybe we can uh, maybe we can get some hooked up connections here and be like, we got the hottie and the naughty too. It's in the works. The hottie and the naughty. <laughs> I actually have two scripts. Um, oh, did I tell you? I have an idea for a rom-com now. <laughs> it's called The Morning After Friend. The Morning After Friend. Is this, like, basically a feature-length ad for Plan B? <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea, but no, it's it's more about... Oh, God, I, I'm not going to go into it. It's, 
All right, but, send me a script. I'll but, read it. I'll send it to my agent. We'll talk. <laughs> but the but the cover is going to have two people kind of looking distantly in clouds and um, kind of confused and or dyspeptic. And the script for the title um, is going to be very curly cued with lots of serifs. Okay. Curly cued serif font. Is this as far as you've gotten? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but um uh but so far it's brilliant um, yeah all right cool uh feel free to send us your feedback uh thoughts questions donations to info at ice on mars dot net for now this is michael t bradley and jay wilford neville have a good one <laughs> i actually found the ideal version of this movie which is there is a version that is the second hit when you search for this movie on YouTube that is the haughty and the naughty Paris cut in which every shot that does not have Paris and Hilton in it has been cut out. So it's often just a smash cut from one of her lines to the next of her lines without the other line in between getting in the way. Uh, it's kind of disjointed and crazy, and I highly recommend that you watch it. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. Beauty's old as skin deep. I don't know any songs about beauty. It would probably be about how, like, it's ephemeral and everyone dies alone. Get some plastic surgery from a rich guy. <laughs>